Good Monday morning of the 14th week in Ordinary Time. Actually, it's July 3rd. Tomorrow is the 4th of July. So if you hear some noise outside, maybe people starting their fireworks a little early. I don't know. Lily is sleeping on the floor. Nothing bothers her, except me. <laughs> That's the truth, too. Anyway, I, I love this reading by Hosea, the prophet Hosea. It's all this week. But this one... Uh, this text, 216, I really, really like it because it's a beautiful portrait of God's love for us with all his infinite power. He can do anything and everything except the, he cannot do the impossible. Can't make a, he, well, he can't do the impossible, the logically impossible. I think that's pretty standard stuff, Okay whatever, but what he cannot do either is lure the human heart. He cannot coerce a free creature, you see. He can't make us love him. Does that make sense to you? I'm fumbling around here. He, can't, he can make us obedient, he can force us like a slave, but he doesn't, he treats us as a friend, in many ways as a spouse. I'll read it to you, this text by Hosea. It's a beautiful text. It's, a, it's a, almost a romantic text. It is a romantic text. God luring Israel. Israel is his spouse. And think of the human soul as Israel. Our souls. God doesn't coerce us. Listen to it. I'll read it. It's a beautiful text by Hosea. I love Hosea. Of all the prophets, I like him the best. Yeah. Watch what he says. Okay? It's from the second chapter. Thus says the Lord, I will lure her, allure her, allure her. I'm, I'm not saying it well. I will allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak to her heart. Isn't that neat? I will allure her, I will attract her and lead her into the desert. Of course, that's an appeal to the Mosaic experience, Moses in the desert. That's the primordial event in Jewish life and history and faith. It's an intimate moment in which God calls through Moses the Jews out of captivity and slavery into the freedom of children of God by crossing the great desert. He lures her into the desert, do you see? I will allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak to her heart. There's another translation that I've read years and years. This is my favorite text in the Old Testament, I think, is this one I just read to you where he says, I, I will speak tenderly to her heart. See? I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her heart. And she shall respond there as in the days of her youth when she came up from the land of Egypt. See? On that day, says the Lord, she shall call me my husband and never again my Baal, the, the false god. I will espouse you to me forever. I will espouse you in right and in justice, in love and in mercy. I will love, espouse you in fidelity, and you shall know the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? I will espouse you with infidelity, with fidelity. See, I will be faithful. Even if you're not faithful to me, I'll be faithful to you. And you will know that I'm the Lord. You shall know the Lord. And that word knowledge, of course, means the intimacy of communion. That neat. That's very. I don't know if I'm right in this or not, but Hosea. It, that's a very heavily erotic language. That uh, imagery that he portrays God's love for Israel instead of a husband to his spouse. That's exactly what he's saying. He, she, sh Israel shall call me my husband and never again my Baal, which is a false god. See. I will espouse you to me forever. See, justice and right and love and in mercy and fidelity. And you shall know the Lord. See, know in that intimate sense, Adam knew Eve. See, I think it's so important how we conceive of God. I think for me, anyway, this occurred, this became significant to me over 60 years ago. 
because I think I had, I know I had such a, uh, Im such an image of God that was terrifying. That's simply the truth. I told you that so many of these videos, I know you're sick of hearing it, but this, this image that Hosea gives is a conversional image. It converted me from fear to intimacy, that God is my loving companion. See? That he is not to be feared, but to be revered, you see? As a spouse reveres her partner, her husband, or his, or his wife, whatever. It's that intimacy of the companionship of the heart. It's an intimacy of the heart, not a terror or fear of the tyrant. And unfortunately, when we were growing up, the image we had, the image of God we had was tyrannical. I don't know why in that period it was such. I'm sure if we were to look at the uh, the story of that, maybe the 100 years, started in 1940, 30 and 40 and 50, and see that where the religious orders came and all the rest of preaching of that time and see what was the motivation behind such a terrifying view of God. Maybe that was the only way that the church could get people once again to begin to worship. If they couldn't get them to <laughs> worship out of love, get, get them to worship out of terror, out of fear. It's a really, I know I told you stuff about uh, fear. I told you that time in the seminary when I, I was visiting a place, the kid was horsing around. One of the seminarians was horsing around during the, uh, during the prayer. We were, they were chanting the divine office. The guy was fooling around <laughs> during it. And I kept, he's going to die. He's going to get hit with a bolt of lightning. Think about that. I was, I think, 17 years old at the time. You know, I thought, he, he's going to get whacked. Why? You, you, you can't fool around there in church. <laughs> Not that I think you can, but even God has somewhat of a sense of humor. I wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was a terrifying view of God, and it was pervasive in the church. It was what the church preached. That's why we, we had long lines going to confession. Those of you who are that are roughly my age, you know that. We lined them up. Confessions. There could be 30 people in line, 25 people in line on a Saturday going into confession. Confession. I know when I was first ordained, it was that case, case six, it was 55 years ago, when we would help out in a parish. We spent Saturday afternoons hearing confessions. There would be three of us hearing confession. We would hear all afternoon, all for, you know, two or three hours worth. That's how many people came to confession. You know? It was a very juridic approach to the relationship we had with God, one of law, rules, with massive punishments. we I don't know how much we loved God, but we were terrified of hell. And it was not hard not to be terrified of it because that was the act of preaching of the church at that time. That really is true. And when the Second Vatican Council came in 1962, it was a conversional moment in the preaching of the church. She preached the love of God, not the, not the divine terror, but the divine intimacy. You were reading now Hosea, luring us into the desert to speak tenderly to our hearts, see, not to blow us off into, the, into hell for getting out of line, but speak tenderly to our heart guide us, allure us, bring, bring us forward into the desert, the, intima, the intimacy between God and ourselves. See, what a different image. I am so grateful for the Second Council, Second Vatican Council, the preaching of love, not terror and fear. Maybe it was important in the turn of the 20th century, you know, from the 19th and the 20th, the church was reviving, and maybe it was extremely important at that time that there be a very rigoristic, legalistic approach to the moral order. Maybe so. I don't know. I know the church got rebuilt at that time in many, many ways. But I'm grateful for the Second Vatican Council, because in the Second Vatican Council, we were called to love, to hear God's allurement, as he allured us into the desert. We were called to love and be loved. That's the truth. So I, because of the church, 
and the preaching of the church and the council and afterwards, I went from the fear of the desert to a desire for it, the intimacy of God. I stopped fearing God. And I hope I never preach a word that entails fear, but rather the allurement of love.